Oh my gosh, I'm back. Welcome back to Building Zion. I don't even know if anybody's watching this because it's been like a year since I've posted anything. I don't think most YouTubers do that. They don't just like take a vacation for a year and then come back. <laughs> so there's probably nobody watching this. But oh well, here I am and I'm ha happy to be back. Um, I did take, like I said, a year break. Um, a lot of it had to do with the adoption of our son. We adopted a, a teenager boy, a teenage boy from Colombia, and he, well, he's great, wonderful kid, um, fits into our family, but there was just so much adjusting, like just, uh, you know, the new dynamic of the family and getting us working cohesively together, and then not long after we got home, I started having some health issues that caused a whole other layer of things. And so I knew that I needed to step back from doing YouTube videos and that I needed to focus on my family, focus on my health, and focus on my church calling. So I'm doing a new format with this. Um, I have, as you can see, this is a slideshow. Uh, it's a Google Slides slideshow, and I've never done a slideshow before. I've always done things where it's typed up and I read it, so there's going to be a lot of me kind of ad-libbing and sharing my thoughts. We're going to see how it goes. This is probably going to be a hot mess, <laughs> and, and you might be gone already. Like, I can't handle this lady. Goodbye. But, um, so Elder Bednar, he gave his talk this last week or maybe last week, depending on when I actually get this posted. Um, Things as they really are 2.0. And it was a continuation of his first talk that he gave 15 years ago in 2009, which was Things as they really are. 2009 is when me and my husband got married. <laughs> so 15 years ago. And so these two talks, I felt, are very significant for the time that we're in right now. And I felt like there are things that I should address and talk to you about and things that I that we definitely need to talk to our children about and as you'll see on my channel a lot of the things that I end up putting on my channel that I do videos about are things that yes sometimes I had questions about it so I research and I learn about it but a lot of times it has to do with how am I going to teach my children certain things I'm not sure, you know, there's certain topics that I'm not sure when they come up how I'm going to teach them appropriately that topic. And so I start diving into it and learning about it so that when the questions come, when the circumstances come, then we know how to, I know how to navigate through that. And I have um, things in my mind, quotes, scriptures, things that I've learned that the spirit can then pull on. And what's amazing is that as that as I've done that, there will even be things that I didn't study necessarily, but the Spirit was still able to teach me and give me the words that I needed in the moment. Okay, so here we are. We're looking at things as they really are, then and now. And so I wanted to, I'm going to click over here to the first talk that Elder Bednar gave in 2019. And, well, let's see if this lets me. Here it goes. So I'm just going to scroll down. I'm going to read a couple quotes here and follow along. So he said, We came to this earth that we might have a body and present it here before God in the celestial kingdom. The great principle of happiness consists in having a body. The devil has no body, and here, herein is his punishment. He is pleased when he can obtain the tabernacle of man, and when cast out by the Savior, he asks to go into the herd of swine, showing that he would prefer a swine's body to having none at all. All beings who have bodies have power over those who have not. The devil has not power over us only as we permit him. The moment we revolt at anything which comes from God, the devil takes power. So the real crux of Elder Bednar of his two talks here is helping us understand how to maintain our own power, our own free agency, so that the devil doesn't take over. 
Okay, and then continuing down. I mean, there's so much in here. You need to go back and read these and listen to these yourself because there's so much. I'm just doing a kind of an overview of things. Okay, because a physical body is so central to the Father's plan of happiness and our spiritual development, we should not be surprised that Lucifer seeks to frustrate our progression by tempting us to use our bodies improperly. One of the ultimate ironies of eternity is that the adversary who is miserable precisely because he has no physical body invites and entices us to share in his misery through the improper use of our bodies. The very tool he does not have and cannot use is thus the primary target of his attempts to lure us to physical and spiritual destruction. He says, we live in a time when technology can be used to replicate reality and to augment reality and to create virtual reality. For example, a medical doctor can use software simulations to gain valuable experience performing a complicated surgical procedure. And he goes on to explain some other instances in which um, it's very useful using some of these artificial intelligences or augmented realities. And he uses the word here, fidelity. And it says that the term fidelity denotes the similarity between reality and a representation of reality. And he talks about something having high fidelity. When something has high fidelity, it seems very real. It looks real, moves real, sounds real, everything about it feels real. And he gives these um, a comparison of these two rooms right here. Just looking at it at first glance, can you tell which one is the di digital image and which one isn't? In fact, the one on top here almost looked more real to me initially <laughs> until I realized that that was the rendering. And this one down here is the um, the real finished temple. And he says, however, a simulation or model can lead to spiritual impairment and danger if the fidelity is high and the purposes are bad, such as experimenting with actions contrary to God's commandments or enticing us to think of doing things we would not otherwise think to do because it's only a game. And he says, I raise an apostolic voice of warning about the potential stifling, suffocating, and suppressing and con um, constraining impact of some kinds of cyberspace interactions and experiences upon our souls. He, he goes on to talk about um, uh, an instance of an intense romantic relationship a woman had with a cyberspace boyfriend. And she talked about how she started to lose all sense of her body. All that was there was just the words on the screen and this, you know, connection that she felt from like her, her upper, you know, lobe here to whatever it was that everything else just melted away. But <sighs> while some people will tell us that, well, you know, your body isn't important, your body is sinful, things like that. Our body is a divine gift from Heavenly Father, and it is our body and our spirit combined that make our soul. So to give up our body, essentially, for something that isn't even real, sure, the person on the other side might be real, but are they really presenting themselves as they truly are on the other side? Um, he says, it might seem relatively harmless, rationalized as a few minutes of needed relief from the demands of a hectic day, daily schedule, but important opportunities are missed for developing and improving interpersonal skills, for laughing and crying together, and for creating a rich and enduring bond of emotional int intimacy. Um, he says, brothers and sisters, please understand, I am not suggesting all technology is inherently bad. It is not. Nor am I saying we should not use its many capabilities in appropriate ways to learn to communicate, to lift and to brighten lives, and to build and strengthen the church. Of course we should. But I am raising a warning voice that we should not squander and damage authentic relationships by obsessing over contrived ones. Um... You can get lost, you know, in the illusion of anonymity online. Social media is really big for that. You say and do things that you wouldn't normally do, immoral things that you wouldn't normally do because you feel like no one is seeing you. But he says the Lord knows who we are, what we really think, and what we really do, and who we are really becoming. Elder George Q. Cannon, he said, God has reserved spirits for this dispensation who have the courage and determination to face the world and all the powers of the evil one, visible and invisible, to proclaim the gospel and maintain the truth and establish and build up 
the Zion of our God, fearless of all consequences. He has sent these spirits to this generation to lay the foundation of Zion, never more to be overthrown and to raise up a seed that will be righteous and that will honor God and honor him supremely and be obedient to him under these circumstances. Um, I think it's interesting that he included this quote because he's, he's um, speaking to and talking directly to and about the youth. And that took me um, in my mind. I remembered about over here, we have a talk that Sherry Dew gave. It was in 2022, Prophets Can See Around Corners. And she talked about how in 2014, Elder, then Elder Russell M. Nelson, he was the chair of the Missionary Executive Council, and he put forward the idea that every missionary should have a cell phone in their hand. And of course, the committee was like, no, that's an awful idea because of, you know, all these hundred reasons, but he insisted that that's what we needed to do. Um, she said that every problem the MEC or Mission Executive Committee predicted happened, but Elder Nelson never wavered in his conviction that missionaries could be taught to use the internet righteously and that they should have smartphones. The test continued and over the next few years, more and more missionaries received phones. Now fast forward to January 2022. And sorry, January of 2020. <laughs> COVID, right? <laughs> Um, that month, President Russell M. Nelson, now president of the church, authorized every missionary worldwide to have a smartphone. Then, just weeks later, the pandemic shut down the world and proselyting as we knew it stopped. Um, Elder Brent H. Nelson, then executive director of the missionary department, was initially concerned that baptisms might drop to nearly zero, but they didn't. Inspired missionaries working from the department found and baptized 1, 125,000 people in 2020, largely because they had smartphones. Oh, I remember, um, let's see, it was in 2015 when I was, I was a seminary teacher, and I remember one of the first lessons I gave them was um, about this very subject. At the time in 2015, it wasn't, it wasn't just widely accepted that everyone has your smartphone at church to use with scriptures or things. It was still kind of a taboo thing where people were kind of like, well, you should still bring your hard copy and having your phone out is a distraction because there's all these things on it, you know, that, that could distract from the spirit. So it was really taboo. And so I said, okay, I'm going to let you guys use your phones in class for scriptures or, you know, other things, but let's watch this talk together. So we watched the talk, things as they really are, and then we talked about what Elder Bednar said, and we talked about how it's not your phone that is bad. Your phone can be good or bad depending on what you do with it. And um, you make the decision, what are you going to have on your phone in seminary? It depends on the time, the place, and the material. So from there, I think that that was a similar theme that kind of happened in different places all around. Now, I wanted to go over this uh, first talk by Elder Bednar first, because I want to say that everything that he talked about in 2009 at the time, I hadn't really seen or experienced all of those things that he was talking about, but the past 15 years, I have seen them all. I have seen um, people getting lost in games, I, I mean, friends and family getting lost in games and losing jobs, um, losing their families and getting divorced. I have seen, um, oh, he talked about in here, I didn't mention it, but that there was one couple that the husband had a relationship with someone online and they were talking about being married in a digital space, but they didn't see it as cheating because it was a, a digital thing, right? I have seen that happen. Um, I've seen people, yes, taking on um, fake identities and really voicing themselves online in ways that they never would in public acting in ways that they would online and they never would in public. And so it's just um, everything that he talked about, I've seen it happen. Okay, so now here we are, fast forward. Let's go back over to our little presentation thing here. Things as they really are, um, 2.0. Okay, so 
he gives a scripture, the spirit speaketh the truth and lieth not. Wherefore, it speaketh of things as they really are and of things as they really will be. Wherefore, these things are manifested unto us plainly for the salvation of our souls. And so these right here, these little um, picture quote things are directly from the talk. He, so you should go back and watch his, his talk. He has all of these things. And he has a ton of stuff that I'm not even going to talk about or cover because there's just time to this video would be so long. Okay, so from Joseph Smith, the building up of Zion is a cause that has interested the people of God in every age. It is a theme upon which prophets, priests, and kings have dwelt with peculiar delight. They have looked forward with joyful anticipation to the world in which we live. And fired with heavenly and joyful anticipations, they are sung and written and prophesied of our day. But they did without the sight. It is left for us to see, participate in, and to help roll forward the latter-day glory. Okay, and then from Brigham Young, he says, Every discovery in science and art that is really true and useful to mankind has been given by direct revelation from God. Though but few acknowledge it, it has been given with a view to prepare the way for the ultimate triumph of God and the redemption of the earth from the power of sin and Satan. We should take advantage of all these great discoveries, the accumulated wisdom of ages, and give to our children the benefit of every branch of useful knowledge to prepare them to step forward and efficiently to their part in that great work. So my main motivation for sharing this is the understanding that we need to have that we need to know how to use these technologies, what the good and the bad is, so that we can teach our children and they in turn can teach their children. So let me give you an example. Um, cell phones. I was born in 1981 and in 1981 anyone that was born around that time we have an understanding of what life was like before cell phones and before internet. Yes there were phones, yes there was TV, most people didn't have computers in their homes and so we know what life was like before and what it was like after. But we, me and my husband we definitely had to learn about kind of the hard knocks of cell phone and internet a little bit on our own because our parents, they didn't know about it. They couldn't really teach us about it. So then my daughter comes along and she was born when cell phones were in full swing and internet was in full swing. She never knew anything different than cell phones and internet. But... The things that were offered to her on the internet, the people that would try to get her to do things that she shouldn't, um, try to entrap her in different ways. Oh my goodness, all of the things. And she, bless her heart. Oh yes, I do live in the South, so <laughs> you do hear bless your heart. Um, she just kept falling for some of these things a little bit and we kept having to try and work her through them and help her understand what people are doing when they are trying to ask this information or trying to get you to do something. Okay, so now the next generation that are coming up, my daughter, she's actually married now and she's pregnant. So her baby is due in April and her baby will know nothing but a world with artificial intelligence. How are we going to teach the grandchildren or the new little ones that are just being born, the new children, how to properly use inter, um, AI, artificial intelligence, and they're going to be presented with it from a very young age if we don't understand what it is and how to use it? The thing is that artificial intelligence is way bigger and more complex <laughs> than just the internet, um, than just some of the stuff that's going on. I'm going to talk about that some more as we go on. Um, Elder Bednar goes on to say, Be wise in your use of contemporary technological tools. Innovations such as artificial intelligence have the potential to both assist you in receiving magnificent blessings and to diminish and suffocate your moral agency. Please do not allow the supposed accuracy, speed, and ease of modern technologies to entice you to avoid or circumvent the righteous work that invites into your life the blessings you will need. My beloved brothers and sisters, there are no spiritual shortcuts or quick fixes. 
He said that these things are not inherently evil or bad, just like he did in his first one. We must learn to use AI in appropriate ways, to learn or communicate, to lift and brighten lives, and to build and strengthen the church. We should not be afraid or attempt to hide from AI, but the righteous possibilities of this amazing techn technological tool can be realized only if we are aware of and guard against its perils. So just like in his first talk, he talks about the perils that can come from these new things. He talks about an AI developed companion. You can have a girlfriend or boyfriend that is artificial intelligence and it can seem extremely real. It can give real time feedback and it can be available to you, the convenience of it, they can be available to you 24 seven with a happy, cheerful attitude and not have the, the complexities and struggles that a real life companion can have. And so it feels easier for us to have that and we can start to feel intimate with such a thing. He says counterfeit emotional intimacy may displace real life emotional intimacy the very thing which binds people together. Virtual, com here, listen to this, make sure. Virtual companions violate the exclusive commitment of a spouse. So just like when we get into things like pornography or um, I don't, videos, things that are not real, but they're replacing that intimacy between spouses, that violates our, um, our covenants that we've made with them. Even though some people might feel, well, it's just a game. <laughs> um, AI companions are only, and he says this very bluntly, are only mathematical algorithms. It does not like you, it does not care, it doesn't know if you exist or not. It is a set of computer equations that will treat you as an object to be act acted upon if you let it, please do not let this technology entice you to become an object. So he talks about how to navigate the complex intersection of spirituality and technology, Latter-day Saints should humbly and prayerfully identify gospel principles that can guide their use of artificial intelligence and strive sincerely for the companionship of the Holy Ghost and the spiritual gift of revelation. I believe that there is going to come a day really soon when things will be presented to you in a digital space and you will not be able to tell the difference, whether it is real or artificial. I think that is happening a lot now. And sometimes you have to be quite savvy to be able to identify, oh, this was just a photo um, that is from AI, or this is this person that's talking this famous person that's talking, this isn't really them talking. This is an AI generated thing of them saying something. Can you imagine President Nelson someday, um, he posts a video and he's telling us all of these things and we're like, oh my gosh, this is President Nelson, he's saying these things, but somebody has created an AI generated video of him speaking. Um, and that is why if we go over here, so this was the talk that President Nelson gave, said Revelation for the Church, Revelation for Our Lives. This was in conference of April 2018. And he said, Our Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ, will perform some of his mightiest works between now and when he comes again. We will see miracles, indications that God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ, reside over the church in majesty and glory. But in coming days, it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting, and constant influence of the Holy Ghost. My beloved brothers and sisters, I plead with you to increase your spiritual capacity to receive revelation. I'm just going to read that one part again. It will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting, and constant influence of the Holy Ghost. I think a large reason for this statement has to do with some of these things with artificial intelligence. Because there will be things that will be presented to us that will sound good, that will sound right, that will look real, that will sound real, 
but unless we have the spirit to let us know that this is not real, that there is no spirit in this, that this is not testifying of Jesus Christ, we won't know and we will be led down strange paths. Um, he talks about how you can go to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.org and on there you can, they have a whole article about guiding principles for the Church of Jesus Christ's use of artificial intelligence. And uh, they talk about using the spirit, wisdom, and trusted sources um, to rely on spiritual connection, transparency, privacy, and security, and accountability. And um, the Holy Spirit, wisdom, trusted sources, yes. So this is definitely something that you should go back and read. And then he gives this talk from President Monson. God left the world unfinished for men and women to work their skill upon. He left the electricity in the cloud, the oil in the earth. He left the rivers unbridged and the forests unfelled and the cities unbuilt. God gives to us the challenge of raw materials, not the ease of finished things. He leaves the pictures unpainted and the music unsung and the problems unsolved that we might know the joys and glories of creation. So President Nelson talks about how um, God is a creator and that we, as his children, have inherited that divine gift of creation as well. And so part of exercising our free agency and part of fulfilling who we are and becoming who we are meant to become is actually creating and not letting something else just do all the creating for us. He gave the example of um, writing a talk that this very talk that he gave, he didn't just tell an AI what he wanted to say. He wrote the entire thing, but then he used AI as a tool to, you can use it as a tool to check grammar, to check the tone of your talk, to make sure that everything is flowing and fitting correctly. There are lots of ways that AI can help us. Even spell check is a form of AI that we've been using for a long time. But to have it write it for us takes away from our creativity, our, our growth in creativity and our growth in becoming like Heavenly Father. It takes away our own agency and makes us just things to be acted upon. So then Elder Nelson, he warns us about the ease of use, perceived accuracy, and rapid response time that characterize artificial intelligence can create a potential beguiling, addictive, and suffocating influence on the exercise of our moral agency. Because AI is cloaked in the credibility and promises of scientific progress, we might be, listen to this closely, we might be naively seduced into surrendering our precious moral agency to a technology that can only think telestial. No matter how sophisticated and elegant AI technology can ultimately become, it simply can never bear witness of the Father and the Son, reveal the truth of all things, or sanctify those who have repented and been baptized. President Nelson then concludes by giving us a warning that is even more earnest, more emphatic. I always want to say empathic here. Emphatic and even more urgent because the technology and perils discussed are everywhere all the time. The Holy Ghost testifies of truth. You and I have a responsibility to assure that the Holy Ghost can always attest to the truth and authenticity of all we say and share both in our form and content. The promise for each of us is that we can learn to use this technology appropriately with the guidance, warning, and protection that come with the power of the Holy Ghost. So, my brothers and sisters, like I mentioned before, I felt so strong about sharing this. One, because I think everybody needs to be aware of these two talks, to listen to both of them, because I think that everyone has probably been affected in some way by the things that he has talked about. And if the things that he talked about in the first talk have all come true 15 years ago, the things that he's talking about in this talk are all going to come true within the next 15 years. And maybe in the next 15 years, he's gonna have another talk, um, you know, things as they really are 3.0. <laughs> if we don't want to fall into these traps we need to be aware of the things that are out there. We need to understand what they are. We need to understand how to use them and how to use them righteously so that we can teach our children and our grandchildren 
and our children can teach their children, and so on, so that we are using these things to help build Zion, to help gather Israel, and not to essentially help Satan do what he wanted to do before he came here, making us all slaves, making us all um, agents unto him and not unto ourselves, right? Being, being acted upon. <sighs> so, yes, man, <laughs> this is, this, like I said, this is a lot different format for me. And I think this was, um, woo, it felt rough to me, but I hope you stuck with me through the end. I am so glad to be back on here and I hope that I can start building community things again. And if you watch this, just maybe say hi to me in the comments or something. It'd be nice to know that there's still some people out there. But um, on the topic of AI, I have thought it would be fun to make AI music. Because I'm not musically inclined, um, I can sing. But I can't do instruments, playing instruments. I've tried guitar and piano. I'm still practicing piano for like the past 20 years and I'm on book two. <laughs> I have to keep going and I'm still on book two. <laughs> so it's super hard for me. It doesn't make a lot of sense. But I can write poems. I'm not going to say they're amazing poems. But I thought, hey, this AI stuff you put in your poem, it's poems I wrote. And then it'll help you build like music around it. So my outro will be um, part of a song that I made using AI, and maybe in future videos I'll have intros and outros with music and all that. It will be lots of fun. All right, guys, I got to go. This is already, like, way too long. All right, take care, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Like stardust, like grains of sand, like raindrops, like rays of light, woven through life. 